today. Sweet. The five-year-old worship leader. I just kept on listening, and God gave me a voice to sing. Who's also a YouTube sensation. That was amazing. Plus, a baby battles for his life. Hunter cannot live with this mass. While his family hosts a call to prayer. The circle of prayers within hours was overwhelming. Hear how his tumor vanishes overnight. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. We've got Alan Dershowitz today talking about the special counsel and obstruction of justice and what all these things mean. But President Trump has called the investigation into so-called collusion with the Russians a witch hunt. But others are calling it a danger to the civil liberties of Americans because of political differences can be turned into criminal offenses then anyone can be a target. At the same time, the government does believe that Russia did try to interfere with the election, even if the Trump campaign itself wasn't involved. Heather Sells brings us the story. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson made it clear that the U.S. believes Russia's actions have damaged the relationship between the two countries. Tillerson spoke with the Russian foreign minister in the Philippines this week at a meeting of Southeast Asian nations trying to help them understand just how serious uh, this incident had been and how seriously it had damaged uh, the relationship between the U.S., uh, the American people, and the Russian people, that this had created uh, serious mistrust. U.S. intelligence agencies believe Russia interfered in last year's election, but Moscow has vehemently denied any attempts at meddling. The problem now, retaliatory sanctions overwhelmingly passed by Congress last month have sparked a tit-for-tat. The president signed the bill despite his objections to it. And the Russia issue carries over to special counsel Robert Mueller's probe into that meddling. Some are concerned that he's gone beyond the scope of his original mandate and could be going on a so-called fishing expedition that would lead to looking into other activities or crimes. Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein says yes, Mueller is not going too far. The special counsel is subject to the rules and regulations of the Department of Justice, and uh, we don't engage in fishing expeditions. Rosenstein says if Mueller finds evidence of other wrongdoing, he will have to ask for permission to expand his investigation. There are also questions about Mueller's impartiality because he has Hillary Clinton donors on his team. And there's concern about Mueller impaneling a grand jury. Does that mean that the probe has now turned into a criminal investigation? Rosenstein says no. Many of our investigations, Chris, involve the use of the grand jury. It's an appropriate way to gather documents. Sometimes you bring witnesses in to make sure that you get their full testimony. Uh, it's just a tool that we use like any other tool in the course of our investigations. Like it or not, the Russia probe and the many questions surrounding it appear to be far from over, and we may be dealing with this investigation for some time to come. Heather Sell, CBN News. Well, with us now is a brilliant constitutional attorney. Um, he is uh, the Felix Frank Berger Professor of Law Emeritus at Harvard Law School. Professor, you have a new book out called Trumped Up, Criminalizing Politics is Dangerous. Well, why is that? It's extremely dangerous to uh, argue that every time a political figure you disagrees with does something that you disagree with, that it's a crime. They've added uh, something new to their arsenal. Now, if they disagree with you, they call you a racist. So they use the term crime, they use the term racist as weapons to try to silence um, their uh, opponents. Um, I was called a racist um, by uh, Congresswoman Maxine Walter and others, Waters and others, um, because I made the observation that no criminal lawyer would disagree with that the prosecutor has obtained a tactical advantage by moving the case from Virginia, which is a swing state, to the District of Columbia, which is 95 percent Democratic. Nobody would disagree with that point, but suddenly I'm a racist. Suddenly Donald Trump is a criminal uh, because you disagree with his political points of view. This is very dangerous. Uh, it distorts terms like criminal and racist 
and 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 makes them less powerful because it's crying wolf. If you call everybody a racist, no one is a racist. If you call everybody a criminal, no one's a criminal. And it's a very serious uh, uh, infringement on civil liberties to be arguing politics by throwing around terms like crime and racism. You, you made a very cogent statement uh, uh, a year or so ago that the president of the United States cannot obstruct justice if he talks to his attorney general or the FBI head to discuss a case. Would you elaborate on that, please? Well, my, my precedent for that is no one other than Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson um, insisted that his attorney general prosecute Aaron Burr. Uh, every president in modern history has had contact with the Justice Department. The president is, after all, head of the unitary executive. The Justice Department works for the president. It's part of the executive branch. And the president can make the decision who to prosecute and who not to prosecute. It's not the right way to handle things. Uh, I would not urge the president to do that. But there's nothing illegal about a president instructing the Justice Department who to prosecute and who not to prosecute. There's long historical precedent. That's another example of people taking things they disagree with and suddenly saying, oh, that's an obstruction of justice. That's a crime. It's just historical nonsense. He goes before Congress, testimony says, I think there was obstruction of justice, and therefore we ought to uh, call for a special prosecutor. The next thing you know, his close friend uh, Mueller is named special prosecutor. But you say that there was no crime, you, you, there was no obstruction of justice in that discussion between him and the president. Is that right? I think that's absolutely correct. But what uh, what uh, Comey did was much worse. He didn't just go in front of Congress or go in front of the media. He uh, leaked the material and laundered it through a law professor friend. And when the former head of the FBI is now doing the leaking instead of stopping the leaking, uh, something wrong is happening in this country. He set a terrible, terrible precedent and, 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 and uh, should never have been involved in leaking material and laundering it through a law professor. That's just not the way the FBI should operate. Uh, Rosenstein said, well, we really need to limit uh, what Mueller is going to do, but uh, how is that going to be done? He's got like a fishing license, and you also mentioned the fact that he's moved the grand jury from Virginia to Washington, which is primarily Democratic, and he's loaded up his staff with uh, pro-Hillary uh, Clinton supporters. Uh, isn't that a bit of a conflict? Well, reasonably, we could disagree about whether or not uh, people on his staff can, can be fair with the District of Columbia, can afford a fair trial. All I said was that he got <clears throat> a tactical advantage by moving it from Virginia, which is a swing state, to the District of Columbia, which is overwhelmingly uh, Democratic. I don't think there's a criminal defense lawyer in the world who would disagree with that statement, and yet it uh, resulted in me being called a racist. And on uh, CNBC last night, I was uh, uh, asked by the commentator, "Have I am I being paid by Donald Trump? And I'm called kind of a, a Trump lackey. I supported Hillary Clinton. I'm a liberal a Democrat. I'm not uh, doing this for Donald Trump. I'm doing this for all Americans as a civil libertarian. If Hillary Clinton had gotten elected and people were screaming, lock her up and trying to create crimes to charge her with, I would be saying the same thing. And the people who today hate me would love me, and the people who today love me would hate me. That's what it means to be a civil libertarian. Sometimes what you say helps one side, sometimes it helps the other. That's not the reason I'm doing it. I'm, help, I'm doing it to help the civil liberties of all Americans who suffer when we turn political differences into crime. And that's the thesis of my book, uh, Trump Up, uh, why uh, the criminalization of politics endangers American democracy. Um, I want to ask you another question about the limits under the, the rules of the Justice Department. A special prosecutor is supposed to investigate specific crimes. There has to be a crime. And what is the crime? And uh, uh, is he restricted to investigations of that matter? Or can he just go on a fishing expedition and, and help himself to wherever he can find anything? Well, we know what happened with Bill Clinton. They started out investigating financial corruption in Whitewater, found nothing, and ended up uh, investigating him for Monica Lewinsky for a sex act. Uh, there are very, very few restrictions on what an independent counsel, a special counsel, special prosecutor can do. 
they follow uh, what they see. And, you know, I always analogize it to the great book by Herman Melville, uh, Moby Dick. Captain Ahab had an obsession. He had to get the white whale, even if it cost him his life and the life of his crew. And I think when you have a special counsel, they have to find somebody. If they don't, they will have wasted the taxpayer's money. And that's what's wrong with bringing somebody on board and saying, we want you to find crimes. It reminds me of what Lavrenti Beria, the head of the KGB, said to Joseph Stalin. He said, show me the man and I'll find you the crime. You can find criminal activities against almost anybody who's involved in complicated business, complicated politics. If you look hard enough and if your goal is to find criminal activity, that's not the way democracy should operate. By the way, we're not the only country that's suffering from that. In Israel today, Prime Minister Netanyahu is being hounded by, by trivial charges of criminal conduct that maybe he took some cigars or champagne or his wife took some trays of food and they're trying to get him out of office, not politically, not through the legal means, but through some uh, efforts to try to criminalize political differences. So this is a spreading phenomenon that endangers democracy all over the world. Oh. You very cogently suggested a little while ago that there should be a presidential commission. If they want to talk about Russia, let a commission do it. Uh, can we transition, do you think, from the special prosecutor or special counsel to a special I mean, presidential commission and shut Mueller down? Or is that possible in today's world? I think we made a mistake. We should never have had a special counsel because I didn't see any evidence of crime. We should have had an independent commission, bipartisan, nonpartisan of the kind that was appointed after 9-11 to look into the impact of Russia on elections. That's not a Democrat-Republican issue. That's an American issue. If the Russians are trying to impact our election, it doesn't matter whether they're doing it to help one side or another. They shouldn't be doing it. And if we had an independent commission, we'd already know what was going on because it would be done in the open. Instead, a grand jury is always done in secret. So we're not going to find out. <clears throat> what actually went on with Russia unless and until <clears throat> the grand jury decides to indict. And if it decides not to indict, we'll have learned nothing. And if it decides to indict, there may be guilty pleas, so we'll never know what happened. It was the wrong vehicle, the wrong mechanism for trying to get the kind of information that all Americans are entitled to, namely did Russia try to influence the outcome, not only this election, but previous elections, and will they try to influence the outcome of future elections. Can we shift at this point in the uh, narrative from the special counsel to a commission, as you suggest? Can it be done? It'll be very difficult to do that, but I think appointing a special commission would still be a good idea. And it would take a lot of the steam away from the special counsel because he operates in secret. He operates behind closed doors without the defendants having their lawyer present. Grand juries hear only one side of the evidence, only one side. That's why it was said by the chief judge of New York, a prosecutor can get a grand jury to indict a ham sandwich. Uh, it's the easiest thing in the world because all they hear is one side. Whereas a commission would hear all sides of the issue, would even invite the Russians to come and, and testify, would invite Democrats, Republicans. We would hear everything, but now we're not going to hear anything because it's behind closed doors. Professor, brilliant analysis. Thanks for being with us. We appreciate it so much. Thanks. Thank you. Alan Dershowitz, distinguished professor, Frankfurter chair, Harvard Business School, and former, I might add, Yale Law School grad a couple of years after me. Let me ask you this, because you have said this, and the professor has now said this, there should never have been a special counsel appointed. Who could have and should have stopped that? Well, you see, the problem was the attorney general had recused himself, so he let this Rosenzweig take over, and he never, I mean, I tell you what, I've run many businesses. CEO, if I had a vice president of my company who would appoint a lifetime tenure of somebody who was an avowed enemy ready to destroy me and it put him in without my knowledge, I mean, what would you do in any business situation? You'd fire that guy on the spot. But Trump is stuck because this Rosenzweig made that decision his attorney general has recused himself, so he's out there all by himself, didn't confer with the president. It was an outrage how this was done, absolute outrage. And uh, 
whether you can roll it back in now, but now, now there, there are some Republican senators saying, well, we want to pass a bill that forces the president to keep this guy, uh, you know, uh, the Mueller, whether he likes it or not. This is an outrage what they're doing. It's an outrage, and it will hurt the country. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your country. This is my country. What we want to do is get jobs. What we want to do is have a tax cut. What we want to do is have a balanced budget. What we want to do is move forward boldly into the future. We don't care so much about whether some Russian talked to some uh, political campaign five years ago. It doesn't matter. But the Democrats made a big deal of it, and they were willing to destroy this society. And uh, you heard the professor talk about the man uh, Ahab who was willing to kill himself, his crew, and his ship in order to get one big white whale. We've got to, we've got to stop chasing the whale and get this country back on its feet. We've got major problems. We've got North Korea. We've got Iran. We've got uh, the breakup of the European Union. You've got all this stuff going on that imperils us, and we have to stop this nonsense. But instead of that, we've given a, a, a fishing ap ex expedition and an unlimited budget, apparently, uh, to a, a, a zealot who's going to do everything he can to nail somebody for a, quote, crime that we're not sure it will ever happen. Whew. A result of the swamp. <laughs> well, it's, just hey, that swamp is crazy. Is, the, the, the swamp creatures are winning, all right. Well, coming up today, the worship leader who's already a YouTube sensation at the tender age of five. Meet Caleb Serrano when we come back. All right, comment, please, please. sweet, I know. Well, everyone likes little children and everyone likes little puppies. And I tell you, to see a little kid doing uh, as a child prodigy, it warms all of her heart. Well, five-year-old Caleb Serrano is already a worship leader who is appearing on two national television shows, five years old. And when he sings, people of all ages are just blown away behind the big voice and the precocious personality. Is a great kid and a wonderful parents. Ephraim Graham has that story. booming voice from this Greensboro, North Carolina church is five-year-old Caleb Serrano. He's the pint-sized worship leader attracting the eyes and ears of millions. And now the drop the mic moment inside a North Carolina church, the video going viral. From the first second you hear him, you kind of can't believe it, but Caleb Serrano, he's got the voice. Hey, everybody. I'm on ABC News. Who encouraged you to get up and sing? Well, and my papa. Your papa. That was your grandfather, then your papa. Yeah. Did he give you the mic and say, I want you to sing this? What happened? I just kept on listening, and God gave me a voice to mm. sing. Yes, papa, stand up. <laughs> And Papa was in the audience when Caleb made his appearance on the hit show, Little Big Shots. Caleb has been singing for how long? Caleb's been singing for a long time. Um, I noticed him having a drive for music since he's been about one. Um, he's always loved music, but he's been singing since he was not able to talk. It's been a blessing that so many people are touched by by my my little one, my blessing. So um, just hope we can continue to do what God has us to do. But it's been it's been wonderful. I mean, it's fabulous. So I imagine those blessings for you through him came long before the rest of the world started seeing. Absolutely. However, it's just amazing that you don't really see what you have, that gift that you have until other people kind of start commenting. Um, and to be real about it, mm -hmm. uh, it's almost like, Caleb, 
be quiet. Caleb, <laughs> what are you doing? Caleb, close the door. Um, until somebody else kind of, they can appreciate. And, you know, then you stop and pay attention. We couldn't help but to pay attention when Caleb allowed us to sit in on his rehearsal here at New Hope Baptist Church in Hampton, Virginia. Lily in the Valley is an old familiar tune from gospel singer John P. Key. You know John P. Key? He's in North Carolina too, isn't he? He's in Charlotte. He's in Charlotte. Have you met I, him? I just went in Charlotte to do Joy Fest. Nice. So you sang at Joy Fest. Yeah. How cool was that? That was amazing. <laughs> now, who is your favorite gospel singer right now? Who do you like to listen to? Anthony Brown. I've met Anthony Brown and interviewed him too. What's your favorite song from him? I, I, I really met him too. You did? Tell me what that was like. Cool. Cool? And I interviewed him. You interviewed him? What did you ask him? He asked me questions. Ah, what did he ask you? Do you remember? He just said that on Harry, I was his favorite singer. Nice. So oh, that was Harry Connick Jr. show. Yeah. What was it like meeting Harry Connick Jr.? It was great. He's sweet. I know. And he's sweet. I know. So, Dad, how does it feel to, to have such a gifted son? It's truly a blessing. The words can't really describe the feeling, um, the raw emotion, the the adulation, and you know the. It's just a. It's just a different. It's a challenge. It's really a challenge. What's been the biggest surprise for you in this journey so far? The biggest surprise for me would have to be, um, just just the positive feedback from around the world, not just. Um, locally, but internationally, how how people are reaching out to to Caleb to to tell them about to tell us about how he's touching their lives and what his gift has done for them. Mm. And these are people that've never seen him. These are people that never they, all they've seen is the videos. All they've seen they've never spent the time with this fun loving, challenging <laughs> five year old that we have. Young Caleb has fans from all over the world, as far as Australia, Fiji, Kenya, Nigeria, and Ukraine. Do you sing? I asked your wife if she did. No, sir, not at all. <laughs> not at all, not at all. We all know our roles and our responsibility, I believe, and <laughs> singing is not one of those for my, for me, you know, so uh, <laughs> I, will tote, I will tote the, the equipment and I will drive the car. Mm -hmm. and he really tries to sing. <laughs> <laughs> but daddy can't what? <laughs> there we go. So we'll leave the singing to Kayla. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, Hampton, Virginia. Well, he's cute. Isn't that nice? Isn't that sweet? He's Little Kayla. Gifted. All right. gifted. Goodness, huh? he's gifted. gifted. Five yes. years old. Amazing. Absolutely. Okay. Really fun What's to nice? watch. Well, up next, a newborn with a huge tumor in his stomach struggles to survive. The most heartbreaking part of it is actually being able to feel the mass in his stomach. It's not letting me eat. See how this tumor vanishes overnight. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. Casey's pregnancy with her son Hunter went off without a hitch. But after his birth, something went wrong. He kept spitting up and soon her baby's life was in jeopardy. He couldn't hold anything down from the first time we tried to feed him. Hunter Chezer was only two days old when his parents, Jake and Casey, noticed a problem. He could only eat about a half ounce of formula at a time instead of the normal two ounces. Um, any more than that and he would spit everything back up or um, any pressure on his stomach um, would make him spit back up. 
Hunter's doctor ordered x-rays. There's a just a, a mass that took up about two-thirds of his stomach. They actually showed us where it was and you could feel it. And so and that was that was probably the most heartbreaking part of it is actually being able to feel the mass in his stomach that's that's not letting me eat. The doctors told them it was life-threatening and he needed to be treated immediately. He said, um, Hunter cannot live with this mass and we need to send him to Denver to, to take it out because he can't eat enough to live with it. I remember both my wife and I were just very scared, very worried. I was blown away. I didn't know what to think. I didn't know what to say. I just, you don't expect to see that in your baby that's two days old. Hunter was airlifted to the Rocky Mountain Hospital for Children in Denver, five and a half hours away. Jake and Casey called for prayer, and from there, it spread. My brother, Morgan, got on Facebook and put this prayer request out on Facebook. And within hours, he had people all over the country and all over the world. He had friends in Australia and New Zealand and England. Um, all his friends and their churches were praying for Hunter. The circle of prayers within hours was overwhelming. Jake's mother, Norleen, called CBN's prayer center. I couldn't find the words myself to pray. It was just that feeling of needing somebody that, since I couldn't put it into words that I knew at the other end of that phone line could. And, and she did, and that's what I needed. Jake remembers the long drive to Denver. Yeah, I was just incredibly worried, and I, I think I spent most of the trip praying for Hunter. In Denver, doctors conducted tests, and a 3D ultrasound confirmed the results. The best prognosis we were looking at was him leaving in two months, but we should probably plan for him to be there at least six months. The evening before Hunter's surgery, Casey was feeding her son. I was in the room by myself and I fed Hunter and he drank the whole two ounce bottle. And, and he was perfectly fine. At that time, I, I was cautiously optimistic because I didn't want to get my hopes up, but something changed. The next morning, doctors ordered another MRI to get a last look before surgery. A while later, the doctor came in and she had a strange look on her face, which scared me to death. It's like something happened, you know, and it probably is not good. But she came in and, and she said, okay, I have news for you. She said, um, we just got done with the MRI and I don't know what they saw, but it's not there now. Medical records confirm the mass doctors detected on the 12th was gone the next day. They couldn't explain it and they didn't really attempt to explain it. I just, I knew he'd been healed. I, I knew the Lord healed him. And yeah. I remember looking at Casey and I mean, we just broke down and both started crying. Today, Hunter is a busy, healthy toddler. Jake and Casey are grateful for his healing and the power of prayer. There were thousands of people praying for Hunter and every single one of those prayers mattered. It's the kind of relationship the Lord wants with us is we can ask him anything, come boldly before the throne of God. That's the truth. We can ask him anything and we can come boldly before the throne of God. He cares about you. He cares about your need. He sees you. And we want to pray for you in just a moment. Mm -hmm. But first, here's Janice from Lake Wales, Florida. She was suffering with a twisted right knee. She was watching this program. Pat, you gave this word of knowledge. You twisted your knee. Could be the right knee. I'm not sure. But you twisted it and you pulled a tendon. Place your hand on that knee that's hurt. You'll feel heat and God is healing you right now. The tendons are coming back together. Janice claimed that healing. The pain left her. No problem. Amen. Here's another one, Terry. This one named Gail, who lived in Camp Hill, lives, didn't lived, lives in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. She had a severe hip problems causing excruciating pain. You were watching, uh, she was watching this program, and you said, somebody you have a problem, you'll know what it is because the doctor called it a pelvic girdle, and it's out of balance, and God's straightening it. 
Gail felt the anointing come on her. She said, it's me. And immediately the hip pain was gone. She hadn't been having pain since. Praise God. I have one prayer request. We have one of the strongest supporters of CBN. I will not name him, but he is in the real estate business, and, and he's a dear, dear friend. He has severe cancer, mm. and uh, we're believing uh, for a complete miracle. So just this yeah. nameless man, I won't name his name, but um, he's a dear, dear, dear friend, and I want us to pray for him. And just remember that all around the country, just pray for this gentleman, mm -hmm. that, he'll be, that cancer will be taken away and he'll be completely whole. Let's do that. Father, I, I join with Terry, Jeez. and we come before you. Lord, we're not worthy to approach the throne of God. We're not holy people. We're sinners, Lord. But we're sinners who've been cleansed by the blood of your son, Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we come in Jesus' name, not in our righteousness, but in his righteousness. And we ask for miracles. We ask for this audience, people who are watching now and are saying, please touch me. I think of our dear friend in California, and I ask for a miracle to reach down into his body right now and bring total, complete healing in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Father, Thank you. again, there's a young child. Uh, you have a twisted intestine, and uh, mm -hmm. you've been, you, you haven't gotten a diagnosis. The parents haven't of what was wrong with him. But God knows, and he's straightening that intestine mm -hmm. out, and his intestinal blockage will be removed, and you are, you. he will be completely healed. Terry, what do yes, you think? Someone else, you've struggled with eczema your whole life. You've tried all kinds of things. Today, God is healing that condition for you. Just receive it. All scarring and marking on your body will be gone. All I can say is peace like a river. Yes. Let peace flow like a river down into your life. You've been troubled, you've been concerned, you've been worried, but let peace like a river come upon you. May the peace of God be yours in the name of Jesus. Yes. Someone Amen. else with a slipped disc also. That's just being set in order by the Lord right now. Receive that. Amen. Amen. Well, wherever you are, if you need further prayer, please call us. If we can help you, we want to do it. And uh, if you've got an answer to prayer, we love to hear them. And uh, you can pick up the phone and call in. Terry. Well, still ahead, we've got your email. Rachel says, I'm 17 years old and want to join the military, but my dad is against it and says, as a Christian, I shouldn't join. What are your views on Christians joining the United States military? Your questions, honest answers are coming up. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Israel's attorney general will likely indict the wife of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for fraud. Sarah Netanyahu faces felony charges for allegedly using government funds to pay for personal expenses involving running the prime minister's official household. The Israeli newspaper Haaretz reports the indictment could come within days. If con convicted, she could face jail time. Her attorney calls the allegations ridiculous. People are more likely to suspect atheists of vile actions than those who have religious faith, like Christians, Muslims, Hindus, or Buddhists. Even other atheists are likely to suspect atheists of immoral deeds, according to this new study. Agency France Press reports it suggests that many believe people will do bad things unless they're afraid of punishment from all-seeing gods. The study shows across the world, religious belief is intuitively viewed as a necessary safeguard against the temptations of grossly immoral conduct. The study in the journal Nature Human Behavior measured the attitudes of more than 3,000 people in 13 different countries, ranging from extremely religious to very secular. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry are back with much more of The 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're back, and we've got your questions, and we've got honest answers. Mm -hmm. Terry. The first one comes from Rachel Pat, who says, Hello, I'm 17 years old and want to join the military, but my dad is against it and says, as a Christian, I shouldn't join. What are your views on Christians joining the United States military? Well, 
You know what the Bible says? That the, he, doesn't, he who bears the sword doesn't bear it in vain. He's a minister of God. That's talking about people in the, in the Roman army. They're ministers of God. Uh, so you have to have some restraint against evil. There has to be a police force. There has to be a military to put down uh, rogue nations that want to destroy other nations. Um, if they weren't for armed forces, then the forces of evil could overrun everybody. So we have to stand up against them. And there's nothing in the world unchristian about joining the armed forces. Now, if you watched uh, uh, Mel Gibson's latest uh, Heartbreak Ridge, it was a tremendous movie, but it had to do with a, a well, it was a conscientious objector who didn't think that he should carry a gun or shoot people. So they said, okay, well, you can be a corpsman. He got the Congressional Medal for the heroism, what he did. But uh, that was an amazing story. At the same time, there's nothing wrong with that. It really isn't. So to, to just say against the Army or the Navy or the Marines or the Air Force is unchristian nonsense. Okay, what else? This is Debbie who says, Pat, Korea is definitely a problem. Could we drop a bomb on them like we did on <laughs> Japan in World War II, or would that be the wrong thing to do? Well, I, you know, the answer to all of our problems isn't to nuke somebody. I mean, yeah, you could probably nuke Pyongyang and wipe out that whole uh, regime, but then what would you have? I, I don't think that would be a good solution. Uh, but we've put some sanctions on, and honestly, they may bite and, and, and make them behave themselves. Uh, but that country is suffering such oppression. Those people are so oppressed. Uh, that, that regime has, has subjected the people to in, in indescribable misery. Uh, there's a book, if you can get a copy of it, called The, the uh, Aquariums of Pyongyang that give a story of somebody in one of those uh, rehabilitation camps or whatever they call them. Horrible, horrible what was done to them. And that, that regime should be taken off the face of the earth. But should we nuke them? No, we shouldn't. But at the same time, there are artillery emplacements pointing toward the south. We have Tomahawk missiles that may be to do a surgical strike. It may be that one of those bunker buster bombs could, could go after some of their emplacements. There's some other things we could do, but right now I think we're trying to do it peacefully with sanctions. Okay, this is Bill who says, Pat, my older brother and his wife, both professing Christians, are having serious problems with each other. Both are angry and very unforgiving towards one another. Does this affect their salvation as in, quote, as we forgive? Uh, Look, I don't know your brothers and sister-in-law enough to make comments about what's affecting their salvation. Um, but I, I tell you what it will affect is their ability to have any kind of miraculous uh, yeah. presence of God in their life. I think that's the main thing. It isn't so much affecting your salvation as affecting the fact that you aren't going to get miracles. God's not going to answer your prayers if you have unforgiveness in your heart. You just aren't. He says, when you stand praying, if you have all against any, forgive. Uh, you're not going to get a miracle. As far as salvation, well, forgive others as you were forgiven. But I, I don't know uh, more. I'd have to know more about your, your situation before I could comment. Okay, this is JR who says, as modern day Christians, are we still under the Old Testament laws, for example, forbidden to eat unclean meats? Um, the Bible says that Jesus declared all foods clean. Uh, he did it himself. So we're not under the dietary restrictions. As far as the moral law, the Ten Commandments, it is eternal. And there are principles in there that are eternal. So I think it's very important. But uh, uh, the dietary laws, according to the Bible, we're not under because he declared all foods clean. All right. Okay, this is Shirley who says, Leviticus 19.28 says, no tattoos or any marks on your body. That looks so gross, especially on women, but now I see a lot of Christian women getting them. How can this be okay? To me, it's like someone doing graffiti on your house or car. <laughs> your body is the home of the Holy Spirit. Well, you said it better than I can. I think it's an absolute uh, ridiculous thing, especially women to get tattoos all over their body. Uh, this was a mark of the pagans. The, these tattoos were marks of pagan people, and this was a symbol of paganism. And so we're, we're moving more into 
uh, paganism, and we've got uh, uh, piercings and all this stuff and things in people's tongues and on their stomachs and so forth. Uh, it's an outrage to invade your body, and it is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Is it a good thing? Of course it's not. But uh, are people doing it? Yes. What am I going to say? Uh, I, you know, it's, I don't believe that, uh, I, I believe that commandment in Leviticus stands true for today. We really shouldn't mark the, these are temples of God if we make them such. All right? Well, that's all the time we have thank for today, you. but thank you for your questions. Thank you for thank your answers. You. Up next, a young man living a life of promiscuity and addicted, addicted to cocaine. Was all I thought about. I would give my body like to people so that I could try to find money to be able to support my drug habit. Watch what happens when this young man learns he is HIV positive. Welcome back. You're watching the 700 Club. We are absolutely delighted you're with us. And I want to remind you. Telephones are available. If you need prayer, you want somebody to talk to, you want to just share your joy or share your pain, somebody's here. And it's 1-800-700-7000. 700-7000. Easy to remember. Toll-free number. No charge. Call in. Well, when his father remarried, Joshua felt replaced by his new stepbrother. Then when his dad learned that he was a homosexual. He kicked him out of the house. But Joshua's mother never stopped praying for him. And before long, her prayers paid off big time. I was asking, like, why is this happening? Or did I do something? Was it my fault? Joshua was 10 when his parents divorced. He was an only child, and life had been almost perfect until then. I had a really good uh, relationship with my father and my mother growing up. We did a lot of things together. We just had a good family. I was very happy. They were very uh, protective over me as a kid. After the divorce, Joshua ended up living with his dad, and his attachment to him grew stronger. I think my dad definitely gave me the attention that I needed as a kid growing up because he tried to pour into my life to make sure he supported me and was there for me in every way. That changed when his dad married a woman who also had a son. No longer the center of his dad's affection, Joshua became rebellious and found companionship elsewhere. During my middle school and high school years, what led me to homosexuality was just the point of really just feeling rejected, feeling that missing relationship with my father that I really wanted, that I really needed. I tried to mess around with guys to try to find love and fulfillment where I was broken and where I felt rejected. And that just caused me to hang out with a lot of the wrong people. By high school, he was smoking pot and having numerous homosexual encounters. It was more just partying, the drug lifestyle, living like a lifestyle of homosexuality to try to find love and fulfillment where I was broken and where I felt rejected. After high school, Joshua went to a community college but dropped out after a year. Then his dad found out his son was a homosexual and kicked him out of the house. And that in turn made my father like reject me there was a lot of wounds and a lot of scars there and a lot of rejection. So I thought I could turn to other things to try to like erase that part of my life, to try to find like this love where I was broken and where I was rejected. Joshua went to live with his mom who had remarried and become a Christian. Although he kept his sexuality hidden from her, she knew he needed God's help. He was doing the party and thing and just didn't know how much in depth that was going on in his life. All I could do was pray for him and you know, for the Lord to protect him and try to keep him out of those kind of things. Seeking acceptance, Joshua moved to a bigger city so he could openly live a gay lifestyle. There were times where I did feel that it was wrong and that I shouldn't be doing these things, but I just continued to go down that pathway because it was, it was giving me this fulfillment and this, this hunger for something where I, I felt broken. A path that over the next two years led Joshua to a life of unbridled promiscuity and an insatiable addiction to cocaine. It was all I thought about. I would give my body like to people so that I could try to find money to be able to support my drug habit. And I was trying to find like all this love and this temporary fulfillment and these things that meant nothing to me. I had nothing going for me. I gave up hope. 
but his mom never gave up asking God to help her son. Praying for the Lord to keep his hand of protection on him and to lead him and guide him and um, to convict his heart. And um, I've even prayed for the Lord to make him uncomfortable if he had to so that he would give his life to Jesus. Then in 2009, Joshua learned that he was HIV positive. And I felt like this is the end of my life. Like, I don't know what this is. I don't understand what HIV is, but I know that like I've been marked with something that has changed the course of my life. I was just completely broken, completely hopeless. I didn't know what to do. Joshua reached out to his mom, telling her everything and asking for help. Without hesitation, she welcomed him into her home. Oh, that's not anything a mother would want to hear, but you know, that's your child. And so no matter what, you stick by your child and you, you support them and you love them. It made me feel great to be accepted by my mother and to see that she was there even through this whole lifestyle of darkness and brokenness. Even though I felt dirty and I felt shameful that my mother said, hey, I love you and I'm gonna accept you where you're at. But there was one condition, that Joshua go to church with her. Again, he was welcomed with open arms. And they were like, hey, we love you. We support you and we're here to pray for you in any way that we can. Not long after, a message he heard at a revival made him finally realize he needed God's love and forgiveness. I just began to break, and my heart, every part of me just began to break open. And I was just weeping and weeping, and I was like, God, I need you. I need you in my life more than ever right now at this moment. I felt an overwhelming love of the Father, of Jesus, that I had never felt in my life. I felt all the shame, I felt all the guilt, I felt everything that was connected to this lifestyle that I was living just be erased in a moment. I felt the love of the Father come in and say, you're new, you're made new, you're mine. And I just accepted Jesus. I accepted him into my life and he shifted every part of my life in that moment. As Joshua focused on living for Christ, he overcame his addictions and homosexual desires. Today, he is able to control his HIV with medication and live a normal life. Joshua's dad also gave his life to Christ paving the way to forgiveness and reconciliation. I believe in the power of prayer and you just keep fervently praying and he will answer your prayers. If you're faithful to him, he will be faithful to you. Eventually, Joshua went to Bible college and earned a degree in worship and music. He's currently pursuing his master's degree in practical theology. As a mother to see where God has brought Joshua and where God has brought him to is totally inspiring and amazing. It's very amazing. And I just thank God for keeping his hand on him. The past doesn't define me anymore. And when you come to Christ, you're a new creation in him and he wipes away everything and gives you a clean slate. Don't give up hope. Don't give up faith. Even in brokenness and in darkness where you feel like you're completely lost and empty, Christ can meet you right where you're at. He can meet you in a moment and in an instant that can change your life. But what a testimony. The Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. All has become new. All that stuff in the past, that's gone. Gone. That you're having your conscience cleansed from dead works that you might serve the living God. God is not interested in punishing you. He's not interested in you wallowing in the sin you've been involved in. What God is interested in is saying, let my spirit come into you. Let me cleanse you. Let me make you a new creation. And I have something wonderful for your life. I will make you a new person. And all the old will be washed away, the things that you're ashamed of. You don't have to carry that shame and you don't have to carry the guilt. Let it go because God will take it away. Now, if you want to pray right now with me and come into that experience with the Lord, I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. I'm going to ask you to pray wherever you are. Pray these words. You pray. I'm going to pray and you pray after me and then we'll pray together. Pray these words. Jesus, that's right. Jesus. I'm a sinner. You know what I've done. I know what I've done. You know who I am, and I know who and what I am. But I come to you, Lord, because I believe that you died for my sins. 
and that you will wash me and make me clean. So I come to you just as I am, without a plea, but that your blood was shed for me. Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, we leave you with today's Power Minute from Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone shall boast. This is Pat Robertson. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.